Hello everyone, this is Gary, and what I thought I'd talk to you about today is something that I've noticed quite a lot of people talking about on the internet, and on uh, YouTube in particular of late, which is altars and sacred spaces. And I thought it would make a very interesting uh, topic for a little video. That said, this is unlikely to be a little video, because there's a really large amount of, of area to cover when you're talking about altars and sacred spaces and I suppose in a way the difference between the two and why you would utilize one or the other or, or indeed both. Um, so I've actually made a little list and just so I don't forget anything and I'm going to kind of go through and in a sense give you my take on it. Now, at the end of the day, it's something that is very personal to you. You know, uh, if you look on, on YouTube, you will find that some people will share a particular altar layout that they use and video it and talk about it. Other people won't. Some people consider it too private to share that with, uh, you know, with others. And at the end of the day, as I say, it's a personal choice. So it is a very, very personal thing. So what I'm going to share with you is, in a sense, my take on what altars and sacred spaces are about, and throw out some ideas, and feel free to throw some back. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the differences and the similarities between an altar and a sacred space. To my way of thinking, a, I mean, it comes down to basically one question, or one phrase in a way, which is that all altars are sacred spaces, but not all sacred spaces are altars. And what do I mean by that? Well, firstly, if you have been practicing any form of spellcraft or religious practice, pagan practice, for a while, you'll be relatively familiar with how an altar is set up, the kinds of tools that tend to be placed on it, and the, um, the general sort of layout and, and the purpose of it. But when it comes to sacred spaces, a sacred space, to my way of thinking, can be sort of anywhere, really. I mean, you know, you might find a, a particular park or, you know, a particular area of the countryside that you like that, you know, feels right to you. It feels comfortable, it feels protective and you enjoy spending time there. That could be a sacred space to you. Equally, you know, if you happen to be lucky enough to live near a stone circle, and you're able to go there, and it doesn't have to be something as large and as grandiose as, for example, Stonehenge. It's just, you know, somewhere where there's a, a ring of stones, a ring of rocks, essentially. You know, that could be a sacred space. You know, sitting under a particular tree could be your sacred space. It can be anything. It can be anywhere. In fact, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, you might even consider when you sit and you meditate and you focus your energy and calm yourself that you're creating a sacred space around you. So a sacred space could be could be any number of things. An altar will tend to have a particular layout or a particular, you might create an altar for a particular purpose to worship a particular deity or perhaps to celebrate a particular festival, you know, a particular sabbat or, or esbat. Or, you know, if, you're, if your path is more uh, along the lines of, for example, 
Greco-Roman tradition, you might be celebrating a particular holiday, you know, like uh, Saturnalia, for example, and you might be creating a an altar specifically as a place of, of offerings. So the two things are very, very different, but at the same time can serve similar purposes. I mean, you know, you could, for example, go at a particular time of year, during a particular lunar phase, you know, during a particular time of the month, around one of the Celtic fire festivals, to, to your sacred space, to the place where you feel grounded and centered and comfortable, and make offerings there. You know, it's, it's the two things are kind of linked, in my mind at least, but not necessarily the same. So that's the first thing to sort of get through. The second thing that I'm going to talk about is specifically relating to altars. And the first question tends to be, well, what do you need for an altar? Now, this really does come down to your own personal judgment as to what you uh, feel comfortable with, what suits your particular path that you might be following. Uh, for example, if you have particular deities that you worship and follow from a particular cultural background, then you might incorporate uh, tools and items and things of value that resonate with that particular culture. So for example, again using the, um, the Greco-Roman example, you might want, you know, if, if you're going to have a chalice, you might want one that is very Greek or Roman in style. Or, you know, if you want, if, if for example, your path is one of a, an Egyptian sort of form, you might want statues or things on your altar that have a very distinctive Egyptian flavor. Equally, you know, you might be more Celtic in your leanings, so you would be looking for things that have that fit kind of a feel to them. Wiccans, for example, who, where, where the pentacle is a very, very important symbol, um, may have a lot of altar tools that have pentacles carved on them, engraved on them, um, welded on, you know, to their chalice or to their athame or, or whatever. So, in a sense, your tools reflect your personal preferences and your um, your path and the sort of the iconography, if you like, of what it is that you actually believe. Now, that said, to my way of thinking, you don't need, quote unquote, huge amounts of tools. It again depends on your purpose. Now, if you are following very specific uh, rituals that were created by others, and I must admit that, you know, I, being that in my own practice I'm quite intuitive. What I tend to do is custom create uh, rituals and incantations and charms to the specific need that I have. So I don't tend to uh, follow in a sense of prescribed, oh, this is the way you do it and there's only sort of one way of doing it. That doesn't resonate particularly well with me. I tend to take an attitude of something is more powerful if you have a personal connection to it. So if you're able to write your spells yourself, or if you're, you know, you have a particular intent and you gather the elements of that together yourself 
combine them and mix them yourself and then put it out there to me that has more potential power because you it, you have a greater personal connection to it so to my way of thinking in actual fact you probably don't need need that many tools and I want to throw out a couple of ideas for you the first one is what do you do when you don't have a lot of space when you don't have you know for example an entire room in your house that you can devote to being your temple room I've read books where I've heard people talk about devoting an entire room to be your temple within your home if you have a large three four five six bedroom house and you have a spare room that is not used absolutely that would be a wonderful thing to be able to create so that your altar and your sacred space within your home becomes this huge separate area that you can have your altar set up in and you can have all of your tools your magical tools in there you can make sure that it is cleansed energetically and that it, the altar is faced in the correct way and, and all these things that you read in, in, in books as being very very important you can also have lots of storage you know cabinets and drawers and various things to keep your herbs and it, it wouldn't that be wonderful that would be marvelous but the reality of it is that most of us don't have anything like that kind of space available to us S and in some instances even setting up a small altar you know a small wooden table with your devotional tools on it is practically impossible in that instance and also say for sake of argument you wanted to go out into nature and have with you a a toolkit if you like so that you can quickly set up an area and perform some ritual or rite or, or some magical purpose actually in nature itself you can't be lugging a great heavy table with you and having you know um, I don't know five foot high 300 pound ornate staff or whatever it's not practical so when practical considerations come in then you have to think that in a sense what becomes more important than the actual tools themselves as being these really beautiful ornate items what becomes important is the intent and the reason that you're doing it and with that in mind I came up with a little kit that I wanted to share with you that you could probably you know almost anybody could get together I would imagine you know so have a, have a look at this now what I've come up with here if you think about it there are four elements that are usually present on an altar representations of air, fire, water, and earth. Those four elements are the things that are usually present on somebody's altar. So, what could you use to represent those four things? Well, let's think about, for example, the element of air. And one possibility might be incense you know 
Um, it, it's always nice when you're meditating or when you're working to have that sort of aroma around you, that smell. It, it's been used for hundreds of years as a way of putting you in contact with, in a sense, a different consciousness, a sort of an altered state of consciousness. So, for the element of air, you could, for example, use something like this, which is a little box, has holes in the top, there, you can see, and you use these little cones, incense cones, in the, in the um, bottom here, you light the cone, blow the flame out so that it's still smoking, place it in the box, you can close the box, although I tend to find with this one, if I do that, I don't think the holes work terribly well, so I find it, it tends to go out. So what I tend to do is I leave the lid up. When I'm using it, I leave the lid up. When I'm not using it, I put the lid down again. And it's a fantastic way of burning incense safely, and also you have your element of air. The smoke being the representation of the element of air. Fire. Now, we, I'm sure we've all used candles of one type or another. If you are doing like a little sort of altar kit in a sense, then a simple thing like a tea light candle, which of course will have a flame when lit, would be perfect for a small representation of fire. For water, then something like a little beaker. I have something which I use sometimes here, which has a little glass insert in it. And it's a little silver, I think it's actually meant to be an ink well, but again, it's what you choose to use it for. Something like that, just to hold a little bit of water, take a bottle of water with you, and you have your container for water. And for the element of earth, I mean that the choice is vast, but if like me you have a real affinity to crystals, then something like, like this, which is uh, rock crystal in this particular case, but you can choose one to suit yourself. You, if you're doing a, a spell or a ritual with a particular intent, you can choose a crystal to mirror that intent. So, for you know, for example, if you're doing something relating to to love, you might choose rose quartz. Um, you know, so it's it it's something again you can personalize. But a little crystal like that would make a perfect representation of the element of earth. So, you have three or four items you may wish. Now, there are some items from your, if you like, your main altar at home. There are some items that you could take with you that are small enough to actually take along. For example, your wand. Now, this is mine, and it's not a particularly traditional wand in the sense it's not, for a start, it's not wood. Uh, I have searched for years for a wooden wand, and to be honest, I found it a difficult search because what I actually want and what I know I want is not easy to find. But this, I've had for some years now, and it's actually pewter. And it has a crystal on the um, on the end here, and it's small enough to take along with you. So, if you think about a a little altar kit, if you like, in miniature that would fit into something the size of a toiletry bag, very very easy to take along with you and use 
and you have all of your elemental associations there with you. So it's in some cases it's a, it's thinking a little bit outside the box, really. Now, with that in mind, there is another bit of outside of the box thinking that I'd like to put across to you. And that is, do you, for magical working, need a physical altar? Here's a little exercise for you. See how, how it works with you, and then feel free to post me some comments and let me know how you get on with it. Imagination. We all know that when you are following a spiritual path and you are working in a, a magical way, visualization and imagination are key. So here's a little exercise for your imagination. Imagine that you, with your eyes closed, that you are in a room. Build this room in your mind. It can be any shape you like. It can be any color that you like. It can have in it anything that you like. It's your room in your mind. You can paint the walls any color you like. It may not even have walls. It might be like a par like um, a parade stand or a pagoda where it's basically a roof with pillars it's your room it's your rules in that room or in that place build for yourself an altar the altar can be made of anything you choose it can be wooden it could be marble it could be stone, it might be carved, it might be plain, it might be a pile of rocks on top of each other. Equally so, it could be something incredibly ornate with a tablecloth or an altar cloth that is silk and has swirling patterns on it. It could be anything you choose. And populate this room with the tools and the furnishings that you would have in your ideal altar room. You can put chairs in there if you wish. You could put a pool, like a carved font in the room for scrying and for visions. You can have anything in this room that you wish and build the room up if, for example, you wish to have physical representations in the room of the four quarters uh, of east, south, west and north, that's fine. These physical representations can be anything you choose. They could be a statue. They could be a mirror. They could be a an ornate door. A portal of some type. Build the room in your mind's eye how you would have it. And populate it with the items, the furnishings, in the colours and materials that you would have. Really spend time in there, in your mind you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, in your sort of meditative state. The great thing about an internal altar of that type is that being able to acquire tools and objects becomes irrelevant. If you want a ruby encrusted gold hilted sword whose blade becomes fire you know at the touch of your will you can have it 
you know, if you want a great big fountain in the centre of the room that splashes out multicoloured crystalline water, you can have it. You can have anything you choose in this room. It is entirely of your creation. You may decide you want more than one room. So, around the room, you build a tower with other rooms. And around the tower, you build a castle. And around the castle, you build a town. It can be entirely what you choose, but it exercises your mind. And then, when you have a particular purpose or a particular intent, you can go into that room, stand in your mind's eye, in front of your altar, with your tools there, and make use of them, and do the things that you intend in that room. Give that one a try. Let me know how you get on with it. Now, we've covered a little bit about sacred spaces and what they are there for. They are a place of calm. They're a place of perhaps great beauty that you like. They may be somewhere, as we said before, that has a special meaning to you. And when, whilst you are sat there and you cast your circle around you, and bear in mind that your circle isn't really a flat two-dimensional ring. Think of it more like an orb or a globe that is circular in all of its axes and it rotates around you. So you have your four compass points, but you also have above and below. So you are in this protective bubble. You've cast your circle and you're able to sit quietly, calmly, and enjoy that space. Now that is something you can also do in front of your altar. So you have the choice. Now, what do you do? Here's another possibility. What do you do when you don't immediately have tools to hand? What options do you have? Now we spoke a few moments ago about creating an altar room in your mind and you can do that that is one possibility you can take the whole process internal so that it's done in your imagination it's done in your higher self but suppose that you wanted you were I know out and about somewhere and you felt the need to do something in particular I had a particular need or a particular intent you, you had and you didn't have your wand to hand for example for um, tracing symbols in, in the air or projecting energy how about this why not, instead of using a wand, for example, to project energy, how about using your index finger and projecting in that way? Or the palm of your hand. This is something I, I do quite a lot when I'm projecting energy. Often, I will use my hands instead of the wand. So you can project using your hand. And if you have a particular element that you're trying to project, 
you can, if you're familiar with the triangular symbols for the four elements, you can imagine that ele elemental symbol traced and tattooed onto the palm of your hand as you project. So, you have your option of your finger, you have your palm of your hand for projecting and in a sense replacing or mimicking how you would use a wand. If you are thinking in terms of how you would use the athame for casting a circle, for example, you could use your hand in a flat way, this kind of thing, to represent the blade. Now you'll notice with pointing the finger this way or using the flat of the hand this way, the palm is downwards. Bear that in mind when I show you the next two postures. Suppose you wanted to mimic or in a sense replace the chalice, the cup, and you don't have one available, then you can cup your hands together in this sort of way. You could even do that with one hand and your palm is up in the same way that with the cup liquid pours into it from the top as it would with your hand. Think about when you wash your face in the morning you cup water together in your hands in this way. For earth which is a very solid uh, stable element a closed upturned fist might be a gesture that you use and again upturned so we have the two masculine energies of fire and air the wand the athame with the palm down or the palm poised pointing outwards, still with a slight downward direction to it. We have the cup with the palms pointing upwards and the upturned fist for earth, water and earth being feminine energies. It really then becomes how good is your visualization you know you can use yourself because the thing is the tools are an extension of you they're an extension of your energy sure you can charge them you can program and enchant items rings amulets your wand your cup your athame, but they're charged with your energy. So you are the power source, or you are the conduit through which the power comes into the item you're using. So, this actually brings us on to the last little section that I'm going to do in this video, which is about elemental associations themselves. Now, Again, this is a very personal area. If you read lots of different books, if you're someone who divines and uses tarot, you'll be aware that different authors have a different take, if you like, on what the different elements are, what tools are associated with them. For example, one of the most common associations in tarot is to have wands associated with fire, swords associated with air. Cups and water, to me, seems fairly, fairly kind of fixed. And pentacles or stones and earth, again, is fairly fixed. Although, 
I have heard of instances where even they have been changed around. But let's take ones and sorts. Now the argument for reversing them and having swords as fire and ones as air is that swords are an object of change and also that swords are forged in fire. Wands on the other hand, being wood, come from trees. Trees grow upwards towards freedom and the air. Perfectly logical, perfectly logical argument. If you turn that on its head though, in magical practices generally, you'll find that your athame or your sword is not used for physically cutting. It's used as a projective tool. So the actual physical changing of cutting something, whilst potentially a possibility with a, a, an athame or a dagger or a sword, is not something that you would generally find someone doing. Even more than that, if you take a wand, think of it in the, its most basic form, a torch, a wooden torch that you light at the top and you, you and it, it has fire on the top of it because you've lit it. Also, the energy projection with a wand you have often as with mine a crystal on it so there is a potential for fire and energy of that type to be associated with wands it's it's a it's a debate that will rage for well probably another several generations but you choose which one you particularly feel most associated with for myself I learned it kind of as one's fire and swords uh, as air, daggers, athames as air. So, you know, you go with what feels right to you. But I just wanted to throw out some other possibilities. Now, suppose we've talked about fire, air, water, and earth as four possible elements. So fire you could represent with a flame, the candle for example. Air, now here's a different one. What do we know in our modern world that travels through the air? Birds. So as a representation of air you could have a feather or a feather fan something of that type. A fan in particular because as you waft it you create a draft, you create movement of air. So a feather might be a possibility. A bowl, similar idea to a cup really, could be used for water and for earth you could use crystals, you could use an actual container of earth itself of soil or you could use salt that would be a possibility here's yet a different set of four elements how about light sound empathy and touch when you sort of get down into it what do the four elements do fire illuminates so light again you have that association there. Sound travels through air. So in the case of sound you have either a bell, it's one possibility, or a chime, or even if you're lucky you might be able to find a dagger that where the blade, you can tap the blade and it produces a note so you have a representation of sound. With empathy, again it's symbolic, but you could use a crystal heart. 
That would be one possibility. And for touch, physical feeling, you could use, again, a rock or a piece of stone, a piece of marble maybe, perhaps a marble statue, or an egg. You know, these, you must have seen these marble eggs, something of that type. Here's one last example. Wind, sky, river, and land, or the mountain. Wind, again we come back to that, to incense, the, where the smoke can be carried on the wind. For the sky, how about this? How about a mirror? So that you have something on your altar that reflects the heavens above it, reflects the sky above it, so you can see it in the mirror. For the river, again, you have a vessel, some kind of cup or bowl or something similar, or if it's something that you're setting up at home, how about one of these small electric water features where you have this kind of burbling water, running kind of water. And for the mountain, again, you have, or for the, the, the land, you have soil, that's a possibility. You have, you might find a particular rock whilst you're out and about. You could use that. It's really a case of what the elements represent to you. Again, it's a personal thing that you can journey into and discover what the elements represent to you and what your particular take on those elements are. You might choose, for example, for water to use a seashell, a large seashell, because it has the connection to the sea, it has the connection to water, and it is a receptacle, it's vessel-shaped. It really is entirely up to you. So, in conclusion, why have an altar? It, well, it's a focal point for your magical work, for your offerings, it's also a place where you can commune with spirit and with your deities, your patron and matron deities. It is a place where you can get in contact with your ancestors, perhaps. It's a place for you to get in touch with the energies around you. It's also somewhere that can be a sanctuary from the busy world around. And this again comes back to this idea of almost of like having a room for it. You may not be able to do that, but once you've set your little area up, even if it's temporary, you can then have that little cocoon of space around you. And also, one, I'll leave you with one last thought. Your physical altar in the material world, the mundane world, could actually be a reflection, a shadow if you like, of your own self in the spirit world. So the two things become two halves of a whole, the physical and the spiritual. And so you're anchoring the spiritual in the physical world. Whatever you do, enjoy it, explore, and tr make it personal to you. Really try to internalize it and personalize it to yourself. I would love to hear your own thoughts on altars, sacred spaces, places you like to go, places you like to be, and ways in which you bring that into your home environment. It would be very interesting to hear. I want to wish everyone much love, light, blessings, enjoy your path and your experiences. Blessed day to all.